This is part two of pain assessment and management in children. So we're going to look at pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic treatment of pain. And just like with our adults, complementary uh, pain management. If a family has complementary medicine that they would like to use, it's our job to help them do what they want to do. So we need to make sure it's safe and then um, find ways to incorporate what they would like to do with what we're recommending. Um, but our job is first to make sure that it's safe to do so. So some of the pharmacologic things we're going to do are our opioids. And with kids, we can use a PCA, just like with an adult. And PCAs, just like with adults, are set where there's a bolus dose. The patient pushes a button and they get so much of the medicine or a background dose where a little bit is being given continuously or both. And with children, it's the same thing where we can have a bolus, we can have a continuous background, or we can have the two. Now, one thing we do with kids, uh, PCA stands for patient controlled, and that's ideal. But with kids, it is not illegal for the nurse or the parent to give a bolus dose of that medicine. The Board of Registered Nursing has a policy statement saying that the nurse may give pain medicine without a request uh, based on our assessment of the patient. Children will often be afraid of what we're doing, so they don't ask for pain medicine. And if we offer it, they say no because they're afraid it's a shot. So on our best assessment, we can decide this child needs a dose of their PCA and they're afraid to take it. Now it's no longer patient controlled if we give it. It's nurse controlled or parent controlled and so we should document that somehow. Um, but I've heard nurses say it's illegal. It is not illegal, but it, it's not ideal, but it is, we can do that. Non-opioids we use. Um, Tylenol and NSAIDs being the most common. Uh, NSAIDs we often give around the clock. If we're expecting a child to be in pain, they've come from surgery, we know they're going to be in pain. The physician will often order, um, Ketorlac is what we tend to use, but an NSAID for the first 24 or 48 hours. And that's given around the clock to prevent pain because we know this child is going to have pain. And then they'll have opioids for breakthrough pain. So if that NSAID around the clock doesn't control it adequately. Um, there's anesthetic creams we can use which numb the area before doing um, pick, usually a pick line or accessing a metaport. And a refrigerant spray. It's a little kind of aerosol looking bottle um, that you spray right where you're about to do an IV start and it makes the skin really cold for a moment and kind of numbs those nerves. Um, I've seen it at children's, but I have not seen it used very often. So here's a girl with the Emla cream. You put it, the cream on, put a tegaderm over it, and it takes about an hour for it to be effective to really numb the site, but she'll be able to get a pick line without any discomfort. So other pharmacologic things we use, as I said in the beginning, opioids and non-opioids. We tend to like um, Ketorlac, which is an NSAID, to be given around the clock after surgery. And remember our NSAIDs work primarily at the peripheral nervous system, so they stop those nerve endings from triggering a pain signal. The opioids work primarily at the central nervous system, so they stop the brain from registering that there's pain. Uh, so the two work at different areas, so it's very effective to use them together. When we're giving opioids, our most common one, particularly if you're doing a PCA pump, is morphine, morphine sulfate. You'll also see fentanyl, codeine, dilaudid. You'll see methadone used quite a lot. Anybody who's been up in PEDS ICU and on uh, narcotics for any length of, for a fairly long time will have developed a tolerance. And with that tolerance, that dependence, 
they've had to go up to higher doses because of the tolerance and the dependence means they're going to have withdrawal symptoms. We don't want this child to have to go through those physical withdrawal symptoms, so we use methadone to wean them off. We'll uh, give methadone and then every day they'll either decrease the dose of the methadone or spread out the doses. And the nice thing, methadone has this long half-life and it works really well for weaning off of narcotics so that you don't go through withdrawal symptoms. So you will see that used um, and it's typically um, to prevent withdrawal symptoms on somebody who we've had on narcotics long enough that they develop that physiologic dependence. So uh, oxycodone, the one we don't use is meperidine, which is Demerol because it lowers the seizure threshold and we don't want a child having a seizure just because of the medicine we give and it also has a long half-life so if it does allow that child to start having seizures we're stuck waiting for it to get out of their system because um, it lasts fairly long. So some of the non-pharmacologic things we're going to do with kids is a containment nest. You're going to see all the babies kind of um, in this little nest. We roll up a, a blanket and put it under either shoulder down their sides and put another one under their bottom. So they're kind of in this flexed position um, which feels very comforting to them. It feels like being in utero. They're used to being very tightly contained like that. So it's a comfort to a child to be in that kind of nested position. Non-nutritive non sucking. So giving them some drops of glucose water to suck on, not for the nutrition of it or the calories of it, but sugar makes us feel good, right? We all know this. Sugar stimulates those endorphins. You just feel good. And there are studies that show giving a child, a, an infant, those sugar drops, they don't cry as loudly nor as long for the same procedure as a child getting the same procedure without the non-nutritive sucking. Kangaroo care, the same thing. There are studies that show children, infants, in that skin to skin and who are getting a lot of skin to skin cry less and for shorter times than children who are not getting that when we do a painful procedure. Positioning. Make sure we don't have kids in a position that's going to exacerbate their pain. So if they've had abdominal surgery, don't stretch them out laying flat. Make sure they're positioned in a position of comfort for what they've had done. And distraction. Kids are amazing at distraction. They can be watching their favorite movie acting like they're in no pain until all of a sudden they're in excruciating pain. We all use distraction. You've had a little headache and then you start doing something you really enjoy and don't notice your headache. You finish what you were enjoying and say, oh gosh, I still have that headache, right? You were able to distract yourself so you didn't notice it. That works for us generally with pretty mild pain. Kids can use it for more extreme pain than we can so when the distraction no longer is adequate they go from looking like they're in no pain to extreme pain because they are they were able to adequately distract themselves from pain until it reached a level that distraction didn't work and for them that's a pretty high level of pain usually um, so don't think they're tricking you or manipulating you they really are in that level of pain even though they didn't look like it when they were playing Legos or painting or coloring or whatever. They were just doing distraction very well. And here's kangaroo care. I want you to notice this baby is intubated. See the ET tube hooked up to a ventilator here? And here's a feeding tube coming out. So if a baby's stable, um, we can do kangaroo care. They don't necessarily have to have no wires or tubes attached to them. I told you about non-nutritive sucking. Well, at Valley Children's, we have a policy which says a licensed personnel, so as a RN, you can give um, those sucrose drops 
without a physician's order. There's a standing order that allows us to do this. So there are some rules. If it's a preterm infant, they can't be intubated, and they have to be over 1,400 grams, which is very small. If they're a term infant, they need to be under four months of age, and we do it before we're going to do a painful procedure. The peak effect for the those um, sugar drops is at two minutes. So we give it two minutes before the procedure, immediately as the procedure's about to begin, and we can repeat it one time two minutes later. Uh, they have, they call them sweeties. They're just a little um, vial, that little plastic thing that you break the top off and put the drops on the tongue. You can also put it on a pacifier and put the pacifier in for the, the baby to suck on the pacifier for those babies who like a pacifier. But again, there are studies that show this really works. Babies will cry not as loudly and for a shorter time if we do this um, if, for the same procedure. And a child will cry more and louder for the same procedure if they don't have this done. So that's the end of the chapter on pain.